innovator's dilemma. Now, uh, innovator's dilemma is uh, is a theory. Actually, it's a title of the book uh, by by the late Clayton Christensen. Okay, uh, he died just last January before the start of the pandemic, so he didn't die because of the coronavirus, but he was very popular. I mean, he, he worked on his ideas back in the 90s, or even as early as the 80s, but he only started to crystallize these things in the 90s. So, so since then, his theory, his framework on innovation, particularly on disruptive innovation, was pretty much mainstream since then. Um, and you will notice that uh, Clayton Christensen will have a lot of materials in this area as, as the years gone by. In, in recent years, um, he wasn't really doing much innovation, but he was doing more of the concept known as jobs to be done. So that is another idea that he was really, he was really putting forward. No? So when, when, you, when you do things, okay, when you create products, create technology, you really have to be concerned on what are the jobs to be done. So if I were to hire a technology to do something, what would that technology do? Or what would that technology supposed to do? And his most favorite example is the milkshake of McDonald's, right? So, so McDonald's, the milkshake, I mean, in the Philippines, I don't know if we still have milkshakes. No? I, Many years ago, I, I remember we still had milkshakes. But in the U.S., okay, they have much milkshakes. And his, 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 his thought experiment was, okay, I'm hiring the milkshake to do some work for me. What is that work? <laughs> okay. Um, and really, the, the work, the job to be done for that milkshake was, was to, to fill the stomach of the driver uh, in, in, in place of a good breakfast. So it was supposed to be a breakfast substitute. Okay. And, and okay, so, so, so that's how he, how he started with his idea of, of jobs to be done. But he was more popular with his idea of disruptive innovation. So let's go through this. Now let's go through um, this particular slide that was developed by, by someone. Um, I also uploaded a copy of the book in Canvas, so just just make sure you take a look at it. Um, so Clayton Christensen, so he really passed away. Um, and this Li Wei is the one who actually uh, created the, the presentation. It's a very nice presentation, so so, so kudos to him uh, for, for doing this and sharing this for everyone. So uh, the presentation starts with this story. So this is John. Okay, so John is a product engineer in a well-established technology company. So, okay, so you can probably think of him as as the as the key player in that uh, that company. And his company has been the leader in this market for decades. So you can imagine going back to that theory of the S curves again, right? So, okay, I mean, I'm probably riding the scale stage. Okay, okay, I'm, um, and then reaping a lot of successes. And it seems like the scale stage might be very, very long. Okay? okay, good. But one day, John's company went out of business and lost his job. Well, this is probably extreme. You don't really just like wake up the next day and all of a sudden you've lost everything, right? I mean, uh, I'm sure the signs were on the wall. Okay, but, but it does happen. I mean, if you don't respond very quickly, and if you're a technology company, and apparently this company didn't have an idea of what the S-curves uh, look like or how they work. Okay, you, you, could, you could lose job. You could lose your job. You could run out of business. Okay. In the past one year, his company lost almost all their competitors to a competitor with a disruptive innovation. So this is the, the starting point right now. No? Um, and you can look at disruptive innovation as a competing technology as well. So something that we've talked about in the S-curve uh, sketches uh, a while ago. John is really sad because his company didn't do anything wrong. Somehow, they lost the comp competition so badly. So um, 
And, and you will notice this, a lot of the leaders, a lot of the managers, a lot of the companies, because they're riding on their successes, okay, there is no indication from them that they're doing anything wrong. Okay. Um, and even at that moment, they're not doing anything wrong. Okay, at least from a immediate textbook evaluation, so to speak, right? Um, they, they weren't doing anything wrong. Okay. Uh, but they still lost. Why? What happened? Okay. Uh, but uh, John doesn't know that his company failed because they did everything right. So this is paradoxical, right? Um, in a way, you are a victim of your own success, as, as, as I said in other, in other cases, right? If you're very, very successful, you get so blinded by your own success that you fail to see the writing on the wall, you, you fail to see other trends that's happening around you, that um, when the conditions, uh, correct conditions came about, uh, they're the ones who start to overtake you. And then you start to lose ground, and then all of a sudden you're not doing anything right. Okay. Now, there are two types of innovations. The, and this is coming from Plato and Christensen, right? the sustaining innovation and the disruptive innovation. Now, sustaining innovation improves the product's performance based on the features valued by the mainstream customers. So earlier, if you recall our graph, okay, the y-axis talks about performance. But performance can take in the shape of so many metrics, right? Here, if the metric that you will be using for performance is a metric that is valued by your market, by your mainstream customers, and you make improvements according to that metric, the type of innovation that you're doing is a sustaining innovation. Okay? Because your market is there. It's, it's, it's being sustained. Okay. Now, <clears throat> it's aimed at moving upward along certain performance metrics. Okay, I mean, for example, if it's if it's speed, speed of performance, uh, speed of processing, okay, then you just keep on improving the speed, okay, and so on and so forth. That's sustaining innovation. And that's fine. There's nothing wrong with that. And that's what most people will do anyway. So just keep on sustaining, right? Especially if you're at the startup, in the scale stages of your of your technology, you will necessarily do innovation at metrics really valued by what your market really wants. Okay, so so that's the flip side of technology. You know, somebody has to use it. Somebody has to buy it. Okay, we'll talk about commercialization later on, right? In terms of exploitation, technology exploitation. But but that's the that's the new ones there. Um, you 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 understand that. Okay, that, that there will be okay, um, that there will be improvements. You, you know that there are going to be improvements. Okay, and in fact, these improvements may even be motivated by your market. Maybe your customers will be demanding more of this or, or more of that or less of this or less of that. Okay, then you work on towards making improvements in those areas. Now. Sustaining innovation, in some literature, you call it incremental in, uh, innovation, right? So these are little things that you build on top of the existing technology, and then, okay, it works. Now, disruptive innovation, on the other hand, uh, uh, here it, it often, often involves lower performance in many product features. Okay, so now you're gravitating towards metrics that aren't really valued as much by the customers, okay? But the thing here, and here, here's the spoiler, is that eventually they, they become more valued now, right? So if you're worried about speed, okay, later on, you know, you're, you're, you, you like to have very fast machines, but you weren't really interested in the look and feel or in the user experience or in the aesthetics of your product. Okay, yeah, you're working with a lot of fast machines, but they're all text-based. And then comes Windows or even Mac, you know, Apple coming up with a graphical user interface. Okay, I mean, it's slow. You don't like it because it's slow. But eventually, the, the metric of aesthetics begin to snowball. Okay, I mean, 
more and more people start to appreciate the value of aesthetics. Okay, there you have it. So, so now, I mean, so that's why a text-based interface uh, has been highly limited already. It's not completely gone. I mean, you still need to have some text-based interface anyway. But its use has been diminished over, 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 over decades. Um, and here's the thing. Uh, when it comes to disruptive innovation, it is born of a niche market. Okay? Um, and that is a market that is often neglected by the current market. Okay, so it's a small, small player. I mean, a small, small, small group of people who are concerned about other things. Okay, so in our earlier example, they might not be concerned about speed. They might be concerned about aesthetics. So they, 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 they like it. Okay, and that's where okay in our in our story here, that's where the competitor of John's company started. Now, sustaining innovation is driven by existing market demand but it can ultimately fail the company. Okay. And disruptive innovation is an unproven opportunity, okay? but it can be the future of the company. So you can see the tension. Okay? Um, if you're the company that has been doing really well with the current technology, and because you have a market to cater to, in a way, it's like you have no choice but to really serve that market and really build on the existing technology. And because of your limited attention space, right, you really can't afford to take a look at other technologies that you probably have to sit down and understand better okay, to the detriment of your current market. So, okay, I mean, I'm, uh, so, so what's, what's gonna be your decision? If you're in a company working on the current technology, you just go with your current company, right? Oh, sorry, you just go with your current technology. So you're not going to do anything anything fancy with, with uh, disruptive uh, technologies, right? But as, as other cases would have shown, well, later on, it can be possible to double with both, but there are appropriate models or appropriate techniques on how you can do that, okay? Um, and, and we'll see that also in a lot of the cases of other very successful companies who've learned to really embrace disruptive technology. Now, we'll talk about that also in the the themes of acquisition okay, or even on exploitation. Okay, so this is at the core of your innovator's dilemma. So as somebody who is responsible for technology, let's see in the case of John, he's the engineer, right, for that technology company. What do you do? Do I build on my current technology? It's doing email, it's paying my bills. Okay. Um, or do I start looking at uh, other upstarts? They're not really doing well now, but who knows? Maybe they will do well later on. Now that's 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 the funny thing about the future, right? You mean your your guess is as good as mine, no? So so you're probably no different, let's say, from an odds maker in, in, a, in a gambling in a gambling institution, right? In a casino, for example. I mean, uh, you can just maybe do your odds, but but you're not you're not sure which one is going to materialize. Who knows, maybe the existing technology will still persist for a few more years. That's also a bet, right? But it's also possible that the upstart technology would be replacing you tomorrow. <laughs> or maybe not tomorrow, that's maybe an exaggeration, but, but sooner than you think, okay? So why did John's company, the market leader, miss the opportunity? for disruptive innovation. Well, let's find out what happened. Okay, John had many ideas for new products and improvements. Okay, so they were getting feedback from their lead customers and did market analysis, which is typical. You, know, you, you have a market to cater to, then obviously you'll listen to your market. You won't listen to anybody else because they're the ones who pay you. Okay, and naturally they chose the best projects for the product or improvement their lead customers would want. Okay, so, so the lead customers are the ones dictating um, how the improvement should go. Okay, that's fine. They did everything right. Meanwhile, the competitor with disruptive innovation, okay, their product was not valued by the mainstream, but they found a niche by trial and error. So it's not as if they had a niche market off the bat and say, okay, I'm going to work with this market. This will be my niche market at day one. No. 
they have to really move things around. In fact, it's possible that when they are dabbling with that technology, they weren't really too uh, cool about it. Maybe they weren't really as excited about it. Okay, but you know, they were they were going through it. Okay. And as their product is improving, okay, the competitor managed to grow the niche market and encroach the customer base of John's company. So, so, so that's the normal normal trajectory of things. Okay? And then lo and behold, because they were focused on really trying to improve their own current base, they, they forget that, okay, somebody else is going to eat them up. Okay? Uh, however, in the newly developed market, John's company hasn't developed any competitive advantage yet there too late. So in history, the same happened to many great companies. Okay? They failed because the very management practice made them market leader also make it extremely difficult for them to develop disruptive innovation. Okay, here's the thing. Um, for sure, if you are the leader right now, if you're doing everything well, okay, that is the curse of success. Okay? You will have that pride, that sense of hubris. But you know, you're doing everything right. I could not go wrong. Why? Because I'm the leader. And, and yet, you will see the stories of many leaders in the past. Okay? Many leaders in the past. Okay? They will be supplanted by up-and-coming uh, brats, so to speak. Okay, they didn't expect these brats to replace them. Okay, and, and and maybe this is the one of the key takeaways that we have here now. Okay, if you are successful in one thing, uh, don't rest. Okay, don't don't think that you're already successful. That okay, we're just gonna we're just gonna coast along, you know, chill, you know, you know, just drive by the sunset, you know, and. Uh, and reap our, our our successes or reap our gains because sooner or later and sooner than you think okay somebody's going to replace you that success that you're experiencing right now that is short-lived okay it's very rare for leaders to be leaders for a very very long time i think that's also the experience of corporate history right even companies that have managed to go more than 100 years okay? um, back then they were leaders in certain areas in certain industries but then maybe after 20 years they've pivoted into somewhere else and then another 20 years they've pivoted to somewhere else again so they weren't really the leaders for that same field for a very long period of time okay even very big organizations like schools you know i mean Globally, you have schools that are hundreds of years old, right? But how they've progressed over the centuries, they've kept on changing. They've kept on changing focus. They've been embroiled in a lot of scandals and a lot of issues. They had to pivot certain things around, okay? Um, and, and, this, and, and that's what happens, okay? So, so, so right now, they're probably a leader in, in this field, but maybe 25 years later, they may not be the leaders in those fields anymore. It could be somebody else, right? So, so that's the, one of the key lessons here, right? If you're, be, be wary or be cautious of, of what success brings, right? It's, it's not going to be there forever. It's not even gonna last for a long time. And, and sometimes we get clouded in our judgments about this because especially for those who've been there from the beginning okay the start was painful having to be uh, let's say an entrepreneur uh, having to start things up you've, you've spent a lot of time money effort right and to build something up and now it's a success it's not easy for you to say well you know the success is going to be short-lived you really want to extract as much as you can because you've invested a lot in it from the beginning so that's understandable but even then, be cautious that, you know, the market is unforgiving. You know, it doesn't really care how much you've invested in it emotionally or psychologically. You know, it's, 
it's uh, unfortunately it's also utilitarian. So, so you you see that okay, if it serves my purpose, if it serves my specific metric of performance, then that's it. If it doesn't serve my specific metric of performance, then I move to, to something else. Now to understand the difficulties, so here's another concept that's that's also being brought up, the va concept of the value network. So the context within which an organization is established uh, to get what it values, okay? So for an established company, what value are they running after? They're running after revenue from their lead customers. So that is their most immediate or adjacent source of value. Okay, they're, they're their lead customers. Okay, that's part of their value network. Now, the highest performing company has a well-developed system tailored to capture the value from its lead customers. Okay, so you have your lead customers. Okay, so so around that, so on the left side, you can see that's that's your company. Okay, and and your company would have good structure, very deep capability, strong culture, strong management. Okay wide partnerships and a very efficient operation. Okay. They've been designed in order for, for, for them to actually grab the lead customers efficiently and really extract as much as you can from your lead customers. Okay. Now within a value network, the system and its past choices of markets, okay, emphasis on past choices, okay, determines its perceptions of the value of an innovation. So, so this is what starts to model things, right? Because you tend to value your current lead customers more, okay, then your choices would be gravitating around that. Okay? You're, you're not going to be open-minded to look at other things, okay? And sometimes it makes sense, like who in their right mind would listen to their most noisy customers who are probably not going to give them the most value or who hasn't given them the most value, right? So it's like this, this would-be customers commenting about this feature or that feature or that feature, but they're not paying you, right? Nobody's paying for that mark for, 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 for that. So why would you even want to listen to that customer, right? Why would you want to listen to that feedback? You're not, you're not extracting value from that customer, right? So he or she, being the noisy giver of feedback who doesn't give money off the bat, okay, that, that person would probably be not in your value network because you're not able to extract value from that type of player in your network. Well, lo and behold, you'll realize later on that they might be important people later on, okay? Uh, it drives resource allocation towards sustaining innovation that is valued by the current lead customers. So, so that's how it is. Okay. And sometimes this is how uh, finance uh, institutions operate. Now, so for example, if I were to, to, to lend money to somebody, right? Somebody, well, the question that the bank would normally ask is, um, Will, will I be able to get my money back, right? Will I be able to extract value from that, from, 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 from this company that I lend money to, right? Will, will, I, will I get something out of, uh, will I get something in return? Well, that's the same idea as well. Okay, you wouldn't want to invest a lot of effort, a lot of resources uh, for customers other than those who've been supportive of you, who've, who've really given you money as well, who've paid you uh, top dollar to actually to, to work on uh, uh, to, 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 your, to your products or to your services, to your technology. So it makes more sense that you listen to your lead customers rather than anybody else. And it will be extremely difficult to keep resources for a disruptive innovation for an unproven market. You don't have any history. You don't have any uh, idea or data to support, uh, okay, I need to support this disruptive innovation. Okay. Now, this pattern of uh, resource allocation accounts for the well-run company's leadership in sustaining innovation and their dismal performance in the disruptive one. Okay. 
Now, uh, let's pause a little here, a bit here, and, and, and realize, well, okay, pattern of resource allocation. That's nothing, well, there, there might be something technological there, right? But really, if you look at it, it's a very practical decision. You might look at it, well, it's an economic decision. It's a business decision. And that's how companies fail from, from what we're seeing right now. They're, they're failing because uh, they're making the wrong decisions and not because they're making economic decisions, mind you. I mean, um, it is also an economic decision to even consider disruptive innovations by looking at it from the perspective of risk. But, but really, you'll notice that it's not about the technology, right? It's, it's not about the technology. It's about the, the shifting trends in the market. Okay. that later on this group of people will be your leaders and then after some time another group will be your leaders and that happens even in society the political winds change direction okay. maybe it will be one party this time around and then after a few years it will be another party and after another years it will be still another party and and that's where the art comes in, right? That's what's why management is an art. You really have to have that sensitivity in terms of what is really going on right there and really exercising a lot of prudence, a lot of a lot of uh, craftiness, so to speak, in order for you to really advance whatever situation you find yourselves in. Now, unfortunately, if you're too scientific with your approach, okay. Of course, from a scientific perspective, you know that this customer is giving me a lot of money. Therefore, I will listen to my to, to this customer. Okay? And, uh, as we've seen it, it's, it's not always the case. Now, if we can turn the time backwards, can John's company do something different to better manage the disruptive innovation? There are many key ideas here. So there are five principles of disruptive innovation. Uh, and we can harness those. So the first principle, customers effectively control the patterns of resource allocation in well-run companies. Okay. So does this mean that we shouldn't be well-run? Well, no. <laughs> uh, you just have to know that the strength of influence of a customer uh, is something that you cannot ignore. Okay, If you're a company, you cannot ignore customers' influence, right? Well, why? Well, they, they pay for you, okay? That's the source of your money. That's how you pay your bills, right? And especially in well-run companies, it can be very, very powerful. It can be very, 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 very solid, okay? So one approach is to give responsibility for disruptive innovation to organizations whose customers need them. So you can have like a spin-off organization okay, or a subsidiary uh, whose job is really to take care of the niche market. So that's one way. A lot of the high-tech companies right now, they're not just like one company, okay? They're actually a series of smaller companies okay? that are grouped together and, you know, I mean, and, and, and they have like a federated control of some sort, okay? Um, for example, in, in our current situation, you have Google. Uh, of course, their, their core business would still be search. Right, but Google is not just one company. It's actually a lot of companies, and their 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 holding company, so to speak, is called Alphabet. Okay. Um, and when you look at Alphabet, really, it's it's a series of a lot of companies. Okay, because the idea there is that we also want to be sensitive to budding, disruptive technologies, no, and they want to be first there. So instead of you know, putting all of your eggs in one basket in a well-run company. Eventually, these well-run companies evolve into diversifying into other other fields. And you see that in a lot of high-tech companies. Google is one of them. We've shared about uh, Amazon. Look at Amazon. Amazon just really started as an online retailer for books. Okay. Then it started to pivot and move into other areas. Okay. We're in, and now they're into IT, actually, if you think about it, you know, they're, they're into cloud technologies. Um, 
I mean, their, their marketplace has been very, very mature. You know? So they're moving into spaces beyond books. You probably know that. They're moving into entertainment. Okay, like, so so Prime Video is, is there. You know? So, so uh, that's one way. You can give the responsibility for a disruptive innovation to some other organization. Other companies, instead of forming like a subsidiary or a spin-off organization, they would buy companies. Okay. So they scan the market. Okay, this is like a budding competitor, you know, but very small, no, not 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 big enough to compete with us directly. What do you do? If you want to kill the competition, buy the competition, right? So you buy you buy that small player, okay? But you give that small player the autonomy to work on whatever it is that they're doing. So you're making an investment in that small company, and naturally, if that technology blossoms, then you're already owning that company. You get to reap the benefits. So, so that's that's one way of looking at it. Now, small markets, number two, uh, don't solve the growth needs of large companies. Okay, so large companies, because they're already large, they will have bigger and more ambitious targets. Okay. Small markets, they will be ignored. Okay, because it's not going to help them meet their targets, meet their goals done in usual annual review. So what do you do? So place disruptive innovation projects in organizations small enough to get excited about the small market. Again, the idea of spin-offs, okay? Your spin-off shouldn't be the same size as your, as, your, as your company, right? As your mother company. It has to be small, but it has to be autonomous enough to make decisions on their own with respect to that small market. And don't expect that organization to be very profitable off the bat just because you're already profitable yourself. Now, you might even be willing to, to, to take that risk that you will absorb losses at the earlier part. Remember, the S-curve, it's, it's really flat at the start because you're starting up. You're trying to learn about the technology. You're trying to make sure that the resources that you spend are, 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 are really capitalized and you get able to reap the fruits of, of those initial investments. So, so don't expect that the small company will be profitable off the bat. Okay. Now, third principle, markets of disruptive innovation may not exist and can be analyzed because they're not yet there. They're not mature enough for you to analyze in an apparatus that is fixed pretty much in an academic sense. Okay. You don't even know that the market is already there. That's, that's the, the, the curious thing uh, about these types of markets. You cannot put them in a frame that is well established, okay? But you have that inkling that they're there, okay? They're there somewhere. You can smell them somehow, but you can't seem to pinpoint where they are. So they're just there, they're just there. Okay, so plan to fail early and inexpensively in the search for the market for disruptive innovation. As we said earlier, okay, disruptive innovation um, by these smaller companies, they happen by trial and error. So understand, okay, that you have to go through trial and error often when it comes to disruptive technologies. Fourth principle, the existing process and values define the organization's disabilities when confronted with disruption. Because you're more established, you've become more mature also an organization, it is not easy for you to just switch and change how things were structured already in the uh, that have been there in the past. So what you do is you utilize the resources of the mainstream organization to address disruption, but not its processes or values. So as it is, how your organization is built, you leave that be. Don't try to really change their soul, so to speak. Maybe the, the better approach, and, and if we've seen this uh, in just a few points earlier, is to really come up with a spin-off. Come up with a spin-off and let the spin-off have its own processes and its own values. Right. So, and then, you know, you, you make your mother company give you the resources that you might need. Okay. People, maybe some cash to get things running. But in terms of culture, don't expect the culture to, to change. And the, the fifth uh, principle here, technology, piece, technology supply may not equal the, the market demand. Okay. And that's because the, the niche market is necessarily small. Okay. 
and you'd be lucky enough to to have a niche right i mean maybe you don't really have a niche yet okay? but but understand that all the technology that you might have the demand may not be there yet okay and the problem there is that sometimes in this situation we think it's a technology problem it's not a technical challenge it's not a technical problem okay disruptive innovation is a marketing challenge we'll talk about that in exploitation later okay i mean how you market uh, innovations okay disruptive innovation is a marketing challenge okay uh it and, and as we said earlier it's not valued by the mainstream but it may be valued by somebody who is not mainstream okay later on for those of you uh, who would know this um uh, other frameworks like the blue ocean strategy right you don't go to the red ocean wherein it's already competitive you know you know and it's really bloody that's why it's called red ocean you go blue ocean you go for other areas that nobody has even considered and all it takes is probably to redefine what this market boundary would be maybe that's that's what it's needed no? so same thing with disruptive uh, innovation it's really a marketing challenge it's not something technological as even as we said earlier okay it's not the technology that made the well-run companies fail when it comes to disruptive uh, technologies okay they did everything right as far as the textbook go but but you know, it's 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 not a technology issue it's a marketing issue okay so just to summarize um when uh, why a great company can fail well a business exists in a value network that shapes the leader's decision it could blind them to the disruptive innovation and lose the future opportunity. To manage the disruptive innovation, you have a spin-off, that's one way, or you can uh, acquire a smaller company that could be your competitor. You match the size of your smaller company to the market that you intend to, to, to attract. You plan for failure because this is going to be a trial and error thing. And don't try to change the company. Don't try to change its culture, its values, its processes. Just make sure, just make sure that you use the resources that's available to you. That's how you negotiate. You negotiate at the level of resource. Don't negotiate at the level of structure or at the level of, of process. No? I mean, in some cases, you might be successful. But when it comes to disruptive innovation, that's probably not going to work. And remember that it is a marketing challenge. It is not a technology challenge. Okay, so okay, this is just a, an epilogue. Okay, um, John's company failed. Okay, but he is not a person who gives up easily. So he joins a startup okay, with a disruptive innovation in a niche market. They don't need to worry too much about their larger competitors. You know, the interesting thing about the niche market is that more often they're not. They are not stingy. Okay, Kuripot. They're not Kuripot. They're willing to spend more. Right? And they're willing to spend more because there's nobody out there who's willing to listen to them, right? And you're here, you're somebody like a knight in shining armor. You're going to listen to them. And this is the first time that somebody has listened to them. They're actually be willing to pay more. Okay? So you might be surprised, even if it's a small market, but because they're willing to pay premium, eventually, you know, you might be able to recoup a lot of the initial expenses that you've spent. So, so don't worry too much. Don't worry too much about the larger competitors because the larger competitors won't even care about the niche market. But don't worry too much about not really earning from the niche market because they're probably willing to pay more. Okay? And they would understand. They would understand that the technology is fledgling, you're still learning, you're still improving it, you're probably willing to, to do more. And this is how early adopters uh, work, right? Um, they're willing to put in more and more, more funds for you to, to improve on your technology, okay? And this gives them time to fine tune their technology and hopefully develop a future mass market. So eventually the disruptive technology becomes mainstream. Okay, and like other startups and entrepreneurs, they will surprise the much larger competitors in the difference. So, okay, so, so, so that's pretty much what we have for uh, disruptive innovations, specifically speaking about uh, 
the disruptive technologies or the innovators dilemma. Um, are there any questions on innovators dilemma or disruptive technologies? Hi, sir. Sarah po. Yeah, hi, Sarah. Um, I was looking at the different angles of blue and red ocean because in the education system nowadays, we are tending to uh, conferencing tools like Zoom, like Google Meet. It's like it's, yeah, it's like yeah. the food <laughs> that provides energy to everyone already. <laughs> and but yeah. before, to other to other uh, I don't know, industry, it has been they have been working with conferencing tools already. So, is it really considered as yes. part of Blue Ocean already? This and based on my context in an education system. Mm, okay. Um, maybe the the perspective that you're trying to take you can correct me if i'm wrong is that if i were the the owners or the developers of these collaboration or or communication tools would i consider the education sector to be like the blue ocean is that a good paraphrasing of your question somehow yes sir because okay. i'm also trying to connect that to disruptive technology okay um okay I, i'll try to look at it both from a theoretical standpoint and from a practical actual standpoint right um and, and i and, and i'll start with the practical because I'll, 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 I'll leverage from my own experience when i was in industry many years ago um when it comes to these technologies um the perception always about the education sector as a customer um it's it's nuanced okay it's it's not easy for technology companies to really penetrate the education industry primarily because of cost right um, schools don't really have a lot of cash i mean most of them no i mean i look at it from the general market most of them don't have money to be able to pay for technology okay and that's even difficult for us because we know that uh, as a technology company we can provide something of value to, to schools okay um but the funding question has always been a challenge. How do you make sure that you're able to fund for, 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 for that technology? Okay. The, the basic textbook there is that, okay, the schools pay for it. Just like any other customer, I mean, schools pay for it. But you know that schools can't afford it. So what are the usual alternatives? Normally, you can get grants. Normally, you tie up to, let's say, a foundation maybe, or even you. As the company, like in the case of the technology company, as a company, we are the ones who are going to do it as part of our uh, philanthropic uh, efforts or initiatives. No? So, so, so that has been a challenge uh, as well. No? Is it something, is it blue ocean for, 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 for a technology company? Well, from a practical standpoint, not really. Um, because that was something that was foreseen already from the very beginning as a possibility, but we just couldn't make the numbers work. Okay. Uh, and then definitely as part of the economic decisions of these companies, they move into, again, you, you, see the, you see the trend. I will go to that market who will be willing to pay for what I have to offer, right? Mm -hmm. And you know, a lot of sectors, no, especially the, the multinational ones, they will need communication tools like Zoom and the like, you know. Um, but then, um, and that's the nature of curveballs, no? Na parang sometimes what you what you experience as basic textbook uh, operations, uh, textbook play, all of a sudden you throw that out of the window, right? like in the case of a pandemic. Uh, I mean, all the theories go out, okay? Uh, and you start to be more concerned with higher higher values, like. You know solidarity you know helping one another and that's why a lot of these companies would say you know let's bite the bullet we're not going to earn money anyway right now you might as well parang, let's 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 take it to the next level you know that's uh, the, those markets that we haven't really gone into yet well let's offer it for free and let's yeah and 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 if you think about it it's not all you know i mean to be fair i mean i i don't want to criticize these companies but it's not all feel like or gender. Of course, we do it as, as a way to build a reputation as a company. 
because later on when things normalize then they will say okay well you know we help this 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 and this schools you know we've helped try to improve the state of things when things were in crisis and all that therefore we're a good company so you know i mean while they may be genuinely helping out it's not for free okay i mean they they they, they will still get benefit from that in terms of reputation which will help them in their in their future business moving forward so from a practical standpoint that's uh that's what i see it's not really blue ocean but before i go with the theoretical part i mean do you have any follow-up questions Hara? no i mean i'm i'm i see it in a clearer view now because now i realize why these conferencing tools were offered in a certain period of time for free for mm -hmm. unlimited period also so unlike if if you're in an education system because if it's not like it will only last for 40 minutes and so but for us on our end it's unlimited so probably that's the reason why they're trying to wear something a good looks for everyone yeah 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 and okay i mean going to the academic side i mean is this something that is this blue ocean really um uh, you, you might even say yes because when these conferencing tools were built, they didn't really have schools in mind, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, so um, it just so happens that the schools could benefit from it. They realized, oh, it's possible for schools to use this. Okay, so, so they, they went with it. If you think about it, conferencing, how it evolved over the years, um, Right now, we have the use of voice over IP, right? I mean, that, that was possible. It's possible now. But back in the old days, you couldn't even do video, right? And if you had to share your presentation, it's a separate solution. And normally, if you have to have audio, you will have to call a bridge, okay? Which is normally handled by a well-established telco. Operators. Like 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 AT&T, for example, and all that. So sometimes, I mean, separately, we'll have to pick up a phone, dial a toll toll number. More often than not, it's a toll from number, but sometimes it's toll free. Okay, so I dial toll free number, and I put in the conference code, and then I'm 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 inside the audio side, but at the same time, I will also be streaming something in terms of my in terms of my presentation Wala pang video no. there's still no video back then okay so that's how conferencing evolved back then no? i mean or how it was back then i mean it, it was two separate solutions okay and sometimes you don't really need to do screen sharing you just you're probably okay with audio so so a lot of the people who are used to doing conferencing um that in a way the the habits of the etiquettes regarding audio conferences that, that's something that uh, a lot of us have really have really been used to already. But you know, for the others, in, this is still new to them, especially schools. I mean, you you were not really expected to 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 go online. Yeah. And speaking about schools regarding the online format, and this is something that I myself, as a practitioner now in the education sector, I, I've, I've seen. When you look at distance education, even conferencing tools weren't part of the picture they knew that there had to be mostly asynchronous ways of doing things. But even in synchronous, it's not even video or rich content like in calls. No? Normally, they would establish a certain time and there is some sort of a platform like a discussion board wherein the teacher can also interact with anybody else trying to post on those discussion boards. Mm -hmm. So that was how it was when it comes to distance education. Thing. It didn't have the idea of using conferencing tools there. So, so from a theoretical standpoint, based on the context, you can think of the education sector as a blue ocean for the conferencing tools uh, companies, no? like Microsoft or Zoom or, or Cisco no? or any of that sort. But, but yeah, I mean, that's, that's, the, so that's the answer to, to, to your question, Sarah. Yes. So it came out as a blue ocean, but not as part of the plan. I mean, unintentionally. Yeah. It just grows up. Yeah. Thank yeah. you, sir. Okay. Thank you for that, uh, Sarah. Anybody else like to ask a question? Okay. Okay. Um, well, if there are no more questions, okay, I'm going to stop recording. Um,